welcome to the Infinity Process Platform tutorial. In this instance of the tutorial, we will create data mappings. In the previous instance of the tutorial, we created our process structure, set up our initial data structure, created applications and an organization structure, and linked them all to the process elements. Now it is time to look underneath the hood of this process and to set the details that relate the data to the individual activities to make sure that every participant in the process is provided with exactly the information that he or she needs. The data mappings are defined in the properties of each activity of the process. So we'll start with the init data step. The init data step uses an application, the support case factory, which creates a data element, the support case data object. So let's double click on init data to take a look under the hood. There are many properties for each activity within the Infinity Process Platform. What we are interested in at the moment are the out data mappings. The out data mapping for the first step is the relationship between this step and the data object that it generates. And this out data mapping creates a relationship between the data element and the resource or application that carries out this activity. Since this is an application supported activity, we need to create a relationship between our support case data application and the data object that we're creating, which is support case data. So as you can see, there are a number of data elements here, such as last activity performer, process priority, and so on, which are predefined data elements within Infinity Process Platform. And we have the support case data element, which is the data element that we created and mapped to this case. So we have to specify the access point to the data element that this application is going to use to communicate. And what we're going to choose is return value map. What this does is that it creates a relationship between the return value of our support case data application, which is a map to a Java object. And this populates our support case data object um, when this application is enacted or executed. So I'm going to apply this. I'm going to click OK. And now when we look on the left side in our outline, we see that our init data step no longer has a red X or an exclamation mark associated with it, which means that it is fully defined. The next step in our process, create case, is a manual step. It's performed by a call center agent. The data mapping here is an in data mapping and an out data mapping because we read support case data and we write support case data. The data mappings here specify which data the call center agent has access to and which data he or she is allowed to write. So let's double click on create case. And I'm going to look at the in data mappings here. There's a default mapping that has been created for support case data. And I can specify the data path by clicking on browse. I'm presented with the data structure in detail of support case data. I'm going to pick the first element here, ID, which is the customer ID. I'm going to click Finish. And now I'm going to rename this to customer ID and make sure you don't enter any spaces here because this is an identifier and not just a name. I'm going to click Apply. And now I want to create several additional data mappings. So I'm going to click Add. My next data mapping again refers to the support case data. And as you can see, the ID here has automatically been updated. I click on Browse. Now I also want to know the name of the customer. And I'm renaming this to customer name. Hit Apply. At the next mapping for support case data, let's browse. We need the email address of the customer. Finish this and call it customer email. Hit apply. And we need two data elements 
from the product side, we need the name of the product the customer is referring to and a synopsis of the problem statement. So we create two more mappings. Again, they refer to support case data. The first one refers to the product structure and now I need to use my next button here to look in detail at this product structure. I need the name of the product, click finish and rename this to product name, apply and add another input mapping to support case data and the data path we choose this time for the product is the synopsis which is the problem description. Okay, and those are our in data mappings. Now the out data mappings describe which data elements our call center agent is allowed to modify. Since this is the first manual step of the process, we have a customer on the phone and the customer is describing the problem to us, our call center agent is or should be able to modify all these data elements. So we perform the same activities that we did for the in data mappings, now for the out data mappings. We map to ID and call this customer ID. We create a new mapping to support case data to the customer name and rename this to customer name. We add a data mapping to support case data with the email address of the customer. Finish this. We need one for the product name. So we browse to product, click next, name, finish and call this product name. And finally, a data mapping, an out data mapping for the synopsis of the problem. Product, synopsis, let's finish this. And we're done with our data mappings. Now you may have noticed that there are two data elements on the product side, the state of the trouble ticket and the analysis by a technician uh, that we have not mapped to the step, which means that these are two data elements that our call center agent does not have access to or does not see in this particular case. So even though our support case data element is a complex data structure that contains all the information that we need for this case, we don't have to map this entire data structure to every step of the process. Every participant in the process only receives the information that is necessary to make decisions or to carry out that particular step. So for our analyze case um, step of the process, we need to do some more mappings. The input mappings for analyze case are all the data elements th that we have gathered in the previous step. So we need the, maybe we don't need the customer ID, but we, we would like to know the customer name. And we would like to know the email address of the customer in case we have to get in touch with them during the resolution process of their trouble ticket. We definitely need to know the product that the customer is talking about. So we click on product, product name.
and we need the description of the problem that the customer is facing, which we find in product synopsis. In addition, our engineers have the opportunity to change the state of the analysis and change the analysis results. So we're going to map these two elements as input data as well. Browse, product, state. So we call this the case state. And the final element that we're mapping is the analysis provided by the technician. And we call this case analysis. Now we need to do the out data mappings. And the out data mappings refer to the data elements that the engineer is uh, entitled to change. The engineer in this case cannot change any of the data that the customer has provided us with. The engineer can only change the state of the case and the analysis description. So we're going to specify this. We go to product, state, and finish this. This is the case state. And we're going to add a mapping to our support case data to the analysis. Finish this. The difference between the input and the output data mappings for this particular process step mean that our engineer will be able to see all the information about the case, but he or she will only be able to modify the state and the analysis. Every other bit of information will be read only. So now finally, we need to create our mappings for the notify customer step and for the deliver patch step. Deliver patch doesn't have any output. It only reads from support case data. So for deliver patch, we're going to double click on this. We have a very simple mapping. We're simply going to read the email address from the support case data so we know where to send the patch to. All this customer email. And for the notify customer step, we need a mapping that takes the support case data and maps it into the application, the notification application that we have linked to this step. So what we have here is mparam1 map as the access point. Uh, which is the built-in method that maps the entire object um, to the application that we're invoking. Okay, and we are done. We have defined our entire process. We have defined our organization structure. We have defined our data structure. We have defined our applications. And we have mapped our input and output data to the individual process steps. To complete the process, we need to specify its life cycle. That means we need to specify who or what can start this process and when this process ends. Under life cycle, in our toolbar, we find different types of start events or different types of triggers for the process, as well as a generic end event. So I'm going to scroll down and I'm just going to add two end events to the process one after deliver patch and the other one after notify customers because once we deliver the patch or we notify the customer the process comes to an end. You notice that you can have multiple end events in a process and you shouldn't try to connect multiple activities to the same end event. If Different threads of the process may end at different times. Use one end event for each thread. 
Now for the start event, at the beginning of the process, we need to know what has to happen for this process to be initialized. Infinity Process Platform gives us a number of options. The start event can be a manual trigger, which means that an employee manually starts the process. It can be a timer-based trigger. That is useful for recurring processes that run at specified times, such as a technical cleanup process that runs at 5 a.m. every morning, or a weekly report that runs every Friday afternoon at 3. The trigger can be an email that arrives and Infinity gives us the opportunity to specify a mail server and what properties of the email will set off the process, such as particular words in the subject line of the email. Or it can be a JMS trigger, a Java messaging system trigger, if we react to an automatically generated message from another system. We will, for the purposes of this tutorial, choose a manual trigger for the process. We'll just place this close to the init data step and connect it to the init data step. Now, as you can see on the left hand side, there is a red X next to the manual trigger, which means that something is amiss. We have not specified yet who can start this process. So I'm going to double click on manual trigger and I'm going to specify who can start this process and we say everybody in Acme Corporation is authorized to start the process. Okay, now the red X goes away next to manual trigger, which means that all the parts of the process that we need to care about have been specified. Mm -hmm.